these sampling distributions. The Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Department of Epidemiology, present the 2002 VA Epidemiology Summer Session. Hi, I'm Marie Diener West from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Department of Biostatistics, and we're coming back now to look at how to compare distributions or um, categorical outcomes between three or more groups. If you recall, before we were looking at comparing two groups that had a binary or dichotomous outcome, um, and then we looked uh, at the beginning of this period at comparing means between three or more groups using analysis of variance. Now we'll be looking at comparing three or more groups ev either where we have a dichotomous outcome of interest or a categorical outcome of interest. And each of these comparisons can be made using a chi-squared statistic. So our test um, is one that's looking at whether or not there's a difference in distribution between groups or whether there's an association between an outcome of interest and, um, and group. So our null hypothesis is stated as no association between outcome and group. And we'll go about looking at data that are displayed in R by C contingency tables that compare the outcome a categorical outcome versus a group, three or more groups. And our purpose, again, will be to compare the observed counts in the cells of the R by C data with the expected counts, those that we would expect if there was truly no association between the outcome and group. So the chi-squared statistic is formed in the same way we had looked at before. Across all cells, all K cells, it sums up the square difference between the observed and expected cell counts and divides it by the expected. So again, if what you observe is close to what you'd expect just due to chance alone, when there is no association between groups, the value of the chi-squared statistic will be close to zero because the discrepancies between the observed and expected counts should be small. So we'll define K as the number of cells in this R by C contingency table that, that displays our data. The degrees of freedom are always given by multiplying the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. And just as we saw with 2 by 2 tables, we'll reject the null hypothesis of no association between the outcome and group if the value of the chi-squared statistic is large. So let's look at this in terms of a simple example. Here we actually have um, a two-group comparison, those who used seat belts and those who didn't, versus an outcome that showed the extent of injury received uh, during an accident. So this is actually a total of 740 individuals who were involved in automobile accidents. They're cross-classified by whether they had used a seat belt 350 had used the seat belt, 390 had not. And then it's cross-tabulated by the extent of the injury, which is a categorical outcome, ranging from none, minor, major, or the outcome of death. So if we had had a dichotomous outcome, we would have looked at um, either dead or alive or some other binary um, classification. Here we have a cat categorical outcome that we can handle easily with this R by C uh, contingency table. So we could look at the numbers. The numbers may not be as useful to us as the percentages, but let's look at how many had died if they used seat belts. 15 divided by 350 compared to the proportion who died if they hadn't used seat belts, 25 divided by 390. So at first glance, it appears that there's a lower proportion who've died in the group that used seat belts as compared to the group that did not. 
So here is a way of looking at the same data. It's just using um, Stata to help us look at the percentages. So out of the 350 people who um, wore seat belts, 4.29%, in other words, 15 out of 350 had died, compared to 25 out of the 390 who did not wear seat belts, or in other words, 6.4%. Now, let's just look at the entire row distribution here. What we have in the second level of this row is the percentage distribution by rows. So we see 21% had no injuries, 45% had um, mild injuries, 28% severe, 4% death, compared to the group that did not wear seat belts in which only 14% had mild, um, had no injuries, 45% mild, et cetera. So in fact, the chi-squared statistic is going to allow us to look at whether there's an association between the degree of injury and the use of seat belts. In other words, does this percentage distribution that we see that expresses the distribution of extent of injury differ for the group that wears seat belts compared to the distribution for the group that did not? Make sense? So on the surface, they appear to be a little bit different. And in fact, if we compared these observed counts to what we would expect if there was no association, we would have, we would have calculated expected counts saying that we know overall this is the percentage distribution. Let's apply these to the totals to see how many we would have expected if it was the same in both. Um, and then calculated a chi-square. The chi-square statistic takes on the value of 9.3. The degrees of freedom here are 3. Why are they 3? One, one. 1 times 3 because the number of rows is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. The number of columns is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. So we would take rows minus 1, 1, times columns minus 1, which is 3, to get a total degrees of freedom of 3. And then we'd have to look this up in a tabled values of chi-square statistics, but we would see that the p-value or probability is 0.025. So based on that p-value, we'd reject the null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis was no association between extent of injury and seatbelt use. We'd conclude that seatbelt users and non-users do not appear to have the same extent of in injury. And based on our data, our data indicate that seatbelt users have fewer deaths and major injuries. How did I make that conclusion? I'd go back and look at the data. The, the p-value suggested we'd reject the null hypothesis. The data tell me that there are fewer deaths, only 4% compared to 6% in those that wear seatbelts, fewer major injuries, 28.6% compared to 35%. So fewer deaths, fewer major injuries in the group wearing seat belts compared to the group who do not. So in summary, we've looked at two methods then for allowing us to test differences between three or more groups. The analysis of variance allowed us to test whether the means were the same in multiple independent groups. We used the F test and then went from there to, com to uh, construct multiple comparisons tests to look at pairwise differences in groups. And then we've just reviewed use of the chi-square statistic to compare either categorical or dichotomous outcomes among groups. So these are two methods that allow us to make statistical inferences um, a, a, among more than two groups, three or more. Okay, so um, here I be happy to entertain any types of uh, questions that you might, might have. Um, so let me just take a few moments here and ask you if you um, have any questions regarding the chi-square statistic. There's a question way up in the back. In looking at the, you know, the, the table of those categorical sort of percentages for the seatbelt study, right. um, you can't really say based on the chi, I mean, you can't sort of pick and choose which ones you're going to claim as being different. Right. I mean, you, you, there is right. a there is a difference. So one could, I mean, in a perverted way, say, well, there's less minor injury if you don't wear your seatbelt. No, that's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, so the question was, 
you know, what conclusion can I really make based on this overall test, this chi-square that's looking at whether the overall distribution is the same or not. And so I emphasize the fact that there appeared to be fewer deaths and major injuries in the seatbelt group compared to the non-seatbelt group. The point was that you could also say that there appears to be fewer um, non-injuries, fewer injuries, 14% in the group that um, wears does not wear seat belts compared to 21% in the group that does. So, in fact, these could be induced by the use of the seat belt, actually. Uh, well, no, this is 21% don't have. In the second group, in fact, what do we see in the second group? There appears to be a higher percentage who don't have injuries in the seat belt group compared to the non-seat belt. It appears to be about the same, 45% in both groups. And then we see slight differences in the moderate and the um, death. So, so in terms of, I think your question was, in terms of the conclusion, could you, would you really, uh, does the chi-square provide you with that any evidence as to what to highlight as differences in these distributions? And it really doesn't. It's dependent on you to go back and then and, um, make some verbal description of these differences. Now, suppose you really were interested in whether there was a difference in the proportion who died wearing seat belts or not. What, what would you think you could do? So you could change this categorical variable that's in four levels to a dichotomous variable where you're interested in death versus no death. And then this would just reduce to a two by two table where you'd have a chi-square statistic with a p-value that certainly reflects that question of whether the proportion with death are the same. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, well then what we will do is move to um, the topic that, that many have been asking about already and uh, we're finally there, is to look at how sample size plays into all of this and how we might, at the beginning of a study, before collecting the data, be before performing statistical tests, we actually take sample size into consideration. So we've talked about this a bit in terms of some of our conclusions with previous statistical tests, but here we'll spend some time on uh, determining how we might estimate the sample size that we need a priori at the beginning of, um, of our study. So what um, I'd like to outline then is looking at sample size for one group. We looked at this a bit before. We've looked at how would we calculate sample size if all that we were interested in was the precision of the estimate. So we looked at this from the point of view of suppose at the outset we indicated we'd like a fairly narrow confidence interval, so a fairly precise estimate. Um, we, we looked at how we might calculate sample size. We're going to extend that into looking at sample sizes if we're interested in setting up a hypothesis test for one group. And then we'll also spend time on looking at sample size calculations for two independent groups. In other words, how we can um, estimate sample sizes for detecting differences in means or differences in proportions in the context of hypothesis testing. And we'll spend uh, just a moment or so indicating that there really are some other methods for sample size calculation, but we'll just be focusing on some of the most common ones. Okay, so part of this should be review. If we look at calculating sample size for one group when our interest is on the precision of the estimator, our um, aim is to have a confidence interval of a certain width. And so We'll, uh, we'll review this and we'll also look at how our assumptions would change a bit if we are interested in hypothesis testing. So previously, we looked at the precision of an estimate, estimator by saying at the end of the study, we'd like to be able to quote that our study results have resulted in a confidence interval of a certain width. So that meant that up front, we had to specify the significance level, alpha, the probability of type 1 error, we had to specify the desired width of the confidence interval, plus or minus so many units. And we had to have some estimate of either the variance in our measurement, if we were dealing with continuous measures, or an estimate of the proportion. So 
Um, if we recall with a continuous outcome or variable, the 95% confidence interval takes the sample statistic x bar, forms an interval around it by adding and subtracting 1.96 times the standard error of the mean, in other words, sigma over the square root of n. So I can call this whole thing 1.6 times the standard error. Let me just refer to that as d. So I could say that I would like to have a confidence interval of width plus or minus d units. So then the width of the confidence interval would be 2 times d. Half the width of the confidence interval is d because one half of the interval is x bar plus d. The other half of the interval is x bar minus d. And then if you recall, what we did was we said if we're setting d equal to some specific value, because we'd like our confidence interval to be plus or minus d units, we could use some algebra, solve for n, and the sample size n would be 1.96 squared times the variance times d, half the width of the desired confidence interval squared. So our point, our, the only knowledge that we would need is some estimate of the underlying population variance. So suppose we um, use an example to illustrate this one more time. Suppose we're interested in estimating the mean age at cancer diagnosis for a certain group of patients. And suppose we'd like to estimate the mean age to within plus or minus 2.5 years. So in other words, d is 2.5. And the width of our confidence interval, plus or minus 2.5, the width is 5 years. And suppose that based on some previous investigation, some pilot study, we can assume that the population standard deviation is 12 years. Now, what happens if you don't have any pilot data or a previous study? Yeah. You guess, right. You guess. Now, you'd like to make an informed guess. You'd like to have a reasonable guess. You might actually not know, have a, a good handle on 12 years, but maybe it could be 9 years, or maybe it could be 15 years. And so you'd actually like to look at the different scenarios by varying these different assumptions. But suppose we felt that 12 was a pretty good estimate. Then we'd solve this equation by plugging in sigma equals 12, and we would see that we would need approximately 89 patients in order to then get a 95% confidence interval for the mean age that's only five years in width. We also looked at this with dichotomous outcomes. So the 95% confidence interval again takes the sample statistic, forms an interval around it by adding and subtracting 1.96 times the standard error that's the square root of p hat q hat over n. So again, I could write this whole thing, 1.96 times the standard error, just express it as d. So the confidence interval takes the sample proportion, forms an interval around it of plus or minus d units. So if I specify d as half the width of the confidence interval, again, a little algebra gives me the sample size would be 1.96 squared times p hat q hat over d squared. So we're in a situation again where we have to make some hypothesis or guess about p hat. If we guess p hat, then we can also guess q hat because it's just 1 minus p hat. So how would we estimate it? Again, we could use previous data, a sample, um, a, a pilot um, study, or we'll um, talk about another reasonable alternative, but let's put this in the context of an example. So suppose we're interested in estimating the proportion of patients with sleep disturbance who are symptom-free 18 months after treatment. So suppose we also say we'd like to estimate this proportion to within plus or minus 3%. So a fairly narrow interval of only 6%. And suppose that based on a previous report in the literature, we estimate p as 0.2. So if we estimated p as 0.2, we'd estimate q as 1 minus that, or 0.8. Solve this equation, I'd see that I'd actually need a fairly large sample, 683 patients, in order to obtain at the end of the day a confidence interval that's only six percentage points wide. Now, what would happen if I, um, if we think about this, suppose I actually wanted to estimate this to within plus or minus two percent. 
So now D would be 0.02 in the denominator. What would happen to the sample size? It would greatly increase. So if I want more precision by having a narrower confidence interval, it would result in a, a far increased sample size. Now, um, I could also say, what if I didn't want it need as narrow of an interval and I was willing to estimate it within plus or minus 5%, then that means the resulting confidence interval would be 10 percentage points wide, right? In that case, the denominator would be 0.05, I would see that instead of 600 patients, I would only need 246 patients. So at the end of the study, I'd have a less precise estimate. I'd have a wider confidence interval, but I wouldn't have needed as many patients. So it's always a trade-off of how many patients are there, how expensive is this study, um, versus the precision that I'd like to be able to report at the end of the study. And here's how we would solve um, this, this um, mystery of if we actually knew nothing about the proportion with the outcome because there wasn't a previous pilot study, there wasn't a previous um, publication. If we set P equals Q equals 0.5, it would maximize the possible sample size. So what if P was equal to 0.2 and Q was equal to 0.8 and everything else remained the same? P times Q would be 0.16. If P was equal to 0.4 and, P was, and Q was equal to 0.6, the product would equal 0.24. But if P and Q are both the same and equal 0.5, then that product is, is 0.25. That's the highest product, the largest value of the product that we would get. So this would be the most conservative sample size by assuming P equals Q equals 0.5. And here we would have needed, instead of 246, we would have needed 384 patients to obtain a confidence interval to within plus or minus 5%. Make sense? Good. OK. Well, that's the simplest way of calculating sample size when we just have one group. And that was just for the purposes of estimation. So let's take this into the hypothesis testing framework. So with hypothesis testing, we're worried about two things, two types of errors. We're worried about alpha, the probability of a type 1 error. We're worried about beta. Remember, that was the probability of a type 2 error. And we'd like to have high power, statistical power, which is 1 minus beta. So with a hypothesis testing single sample sample size, we need to set alpha, set beta, and state the clinically meaningful difference in terms of a null and alternative hypothesis. And again, for continuous data, we'd need an estimate of the variance. So I'm just going to review those errors, statistical errors again with you. Remember that a type 1 error was the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. Alpha is the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. It's the probability of a type 1 error. A type 2 error, we said, happened when we accepted a false null hypothesis. So in other words, beta is the probability of a type 2 error, and power was 1 minus beta, the probability of correctly rejecting a null hypothesis when it's false. So if we remember those definitions then, and put this into a one group, continuous outcome situation, our null hypothesis will be that the true but unknown population mean takes on some value mu naught, mu 1. The alternative will be that the true but unknown population mean takes on some value mu 2. So the difference between these two hypothesized values we can call delta, mu 1 minus mu 2. And for the hypothesis testing framework, we would need to solve for the sample size as a function of both alpha and beta and variance, as well as this difference that we'd like to detect between a null and alternative hypothesis. So the components of sample size calculation for one group when you have hypothesis testing are specifying alpha and beta, taking a guess at the variance, and specifying the, the delta that uh, distinguishes the null hypothesis and the alternative. So let's see if we can make um, some sense of that as well as the
corresponding um, sample size calculation for dichotomous outcomes. This should say dichotomous outcomes. So if, our, if a proportion is the outcome of interest, then again, the sample size will be, depend on alpha and beta. It will depend on the difference in the hypothesized values between the null and the alternative, what we're calling delta. And it depends on our, as well, the level of P and Q that we can assume. Okay, so again, we have to specify the same things for two groups, whether we have continuous or dichotomous outcomes. So a two-group comparison is going to be based on taking one sample from each of two independent populations. Let me back up a bit just to um, see if you had any questions regarding the one-group sample size calculations. So. If we look at the continuous outcome, what differs between our sample size calculation for um, one group based on, based on hypothesis testing versus just getting a confidence interval at the end? Any ideas? I could ask this in a different way. What looks different between this formulation and, I'll take you back to, this formulation. So what's differing is that all that we're concerned with is alpha here. So the z of alpha is 1.96. We still have to worry about an estimate of variance. We're still interested in um, a d or difference of interest. But if we go back to the sample size formulation for um, a hypothesis testing situation, we've also brought in z of beta which allows us to set beta, the probability of a type 2 error. Otherwise, they're fairly similar. Um, it's just that this one brings in both errors into play. OK. Well, then let's look at um, sample size for two groups. And uh, we'll go through this. We'll look at some examples. And then we'll see also some calculators that are available on the internet, as well as using Stata. So with two group hypotheses, we still are worried about alpha and beta, the probability of one and two errors. We're interested in detecting a clinically meaningful difference between groups, so we have to specify what is clinically meaningful to us. And we need an estimate of variance in each group. So the null hypothesis is going to be that the difference in means is equal to zero versus an alternative hypothesis that the difference in means is some clinically meaningful difference delta. So that's for continuous outcomes. It's similar for dichotomous outcomes. The null hypothesis is that the difference in proportions equals 0 versus the alternative that the difference in proportions is equal to delta, some clinically meaningful um, difference. OK, so the, um, there was a question about going over slides 14 and 15. So in fact, they are different. The first one on slide 14, we're looking at a continuous outcome. And um, we're aiming at being able to test a hypothesis that the true mean value is some value mu naught versus an alternative that it's mu 2. And we have um, z corresponding to the alpha of interest, z corresponding to the beta of, that we're setting of interest, an estimate of variance, and then the delta, the difference between these two values, mu 1. Um, in the denominator. 15, slide 15 is different because although the title says continuous, this is really the scenario for dichotomous outcomes, where the null hypothesis is that P equals P1. The alternative is that the true population proportion equals P2. So what differs is that instead of having sigma squared here, as we saw in the previous so slide for continuous outcomes, what we have in the numerator is P times Q. So if I just look back, the difference was sigma squared here for continuous data. That's our estimate of variance. For dichotomous data, we're using p times q, our estimates of the proportions, and 1 minus p, which is q. OK, so let's uh, look at this diagrammatically in terms of having a two-group hypothesis test where our null hypothesis is that the difference between means is equal to 0. The alternative hypothesis is that the difference between means is actually something different. It's equal to something we're hypothesizing as being clinically relevant, delta. 
So what if we set up the null hypothesis for our hypothesis test, remember that our rejection region is what is shaded in blue here out in the tails of the distribution. So our probability of making a type 1 error is what's shaded in blue. That's alpha. The probability of making a type 2 error is what's shaded in orange. So if there truly was a difference between the groups, we'd focus on this alternative distribution. So if there truly was a difference, delta, between the true means, then the mistake we would make that's shaded in, in orange is all of the values of the test statistic that fall in this acceptance region. But in fact, if the alternative is true, all of these are values for which we would not reject the null hypothesis. But in fact, what's true? The alternative is true. So if we look at just the distribution on the right, what's shaded in orange is the probability of rejecting, of failing to reject. So would we reject the null hypothesis for these values? No. no. So what's in orange is the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis, but it occurs when the alternative is really true. So orange gives beta. 1 minus the orange part is, the, is 1 minus beta. What's highlighted in gray here is the statistical power of the test or the probability of actually rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative is true. So this is just a diagrammatic way of thinking of it. If we restricted our attention to the left-hand distribution, this is under the assumption the null hypothesis is true. And the probability of making a mistake when the null hypothesis is true is what's highlighted in blue. It's the probability of a type 1 error. When the alternative is true, we can also make a mistake. And that mistake is what's highlighted in orange. It's the probability of a type 2 error. It's the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false because the alternative is true. So the orange is the probability of a type 2 error. The gray part, which is 1 minus that orange probability, is the statistical power of the test. So the sample size has to do with the fact that if we specify a delta of interest, what happens if we were interested in a smaller difference? What would happen to this right-hand distribution if delta was smaller? It would shift to the left which means if we shifted this distribution, what would ha happen to the orange part? It would grow, and if the orange part grows, that means the probability of a type 2 error grows, and the statistical power, 1 minus that, would have to decrease. What happens if we are interested in detecting a bigger delta? So now we shift this distribution over to the right. We'd find that the probability of a type 2 error or the orange part would decrease and the power would increase. So in other words, we have much higher power to detect a big difference between two groups than power to detect a small difference between groups for the same fixed sample size. Okay, well, for some this may be helpful to look at these curves. For others, don't worry if these curves aren't helpful because you don't, you don't need need them specifically. But let us think about the choices of alpha. Remember when we chose a significance level of 0.05, then z of alpha of interest was 1.645 if we were um, dealing with a one-sided test, because then we would place all of the alpha in one tail of the distribution. Whereas if we split the alpha into two tails, 0.025, z of alpha over 2 is 1.96. And We'll talk about our choice of beta as well. Um, under the alternative hypothesis, where we're assuming the true difference is delta, z of beta corresponds to that same cut point that defined the probability of a um, type 1 error. So look at what's in blue. It's the one-tailed probability of a type 1 error. If I looked at that cut point and drew a line and then just focused attention on the alternative distribution, the beta that corresponds to that 
is um, the one that, that uh, is determined by that cut point. Now, the sample size will help us keep beta as well. So we can look at focusing just attention on the alternative if we wanted to minimize the probability of a type 2 error by setting beta to 0.2, so a 20% chance of making a mistake by failing to reject the null hypothesis when it's really false, then the z of beta that we would get from the table, from the z table, is equal to 0.84. So just keep that in mind as a, as a common value of z. When beta, this one-tailed beta is equal to 0.2, z of beta is 0.84. If we actually want only a 10% chance of making a type 2 error, the z of beta will increase to 1.28. So if beta was 20%, what's the statistical power? 80% because it's 1 minus beta. If we set beta at 10%, what's the statistical power? 90%. So the sample size formulations are given here. You're probably never going to have to use these by hand. There are plenty of statistical programs, and I'll show you some applets that are available. But let's just talk about what's involved. This is saying that for two groups, in order to detect a difference delta between the two groups and their means, we would need n in each group to take on this size. So it depends on what we fix as alpha, beta, our estimates of variance in both groups, and that clinically meaningful difference delta. And the same for a two-group comparison when we have dichotomous outcomes. The number we would need in each group depends on alpha, beta, the delta of interest, as well as what the values of P1 and, Q and P2 are. So what are P1 and P2? They're the proportions that we um, are assuming exist in these two underlying populations. If we know P1 or assume P1, then Q1 is just 1 minus that. Your notes should say then plus P2 times Q2. So if we know P2, we'd also ha make an assumption about Q2 because it's just 1 minus P2. And then the only other thing, if you really were stuck somewhere and you had to calculate this by hand, what do you think P bar is? <laughs> Let's see, I heard a couple of things. What did you say? The average. So in fact, P bar is going to be our, our guess of the overall P by taking the average of P1 and P2. Okay, so let's bring this in, in the context of what influences sample size then. So well, certainly we can see that the sample size is going to be influenced by the variance. If we have bigger variability or larger variance, what happens to the sample size? It's in the numerator, so the sample size would increase, right? So whatever we have in the numerator, if it increases, will increase sample size. What happens to um, the z value if we decrease alpha? It'll increase z. What happens to the z value if we decrease beta? It also increases z. So anything that we have in the numerator will increase the sample size. If we minimize alpha and minimize beta, we would, have, we would need a, a larger sample size. Whereas this delta, this clinically meaningful difference, we've talked about already. If we're looking for a smaller difference and it's in the denominator, what happens to the necessary sample size? It increases, whereas if we're looking for a larger difference, that sample size will decrease. Well, I'm going to show you um, the same formulation here. Um, the values of P1 and, and P2 will certainly influence the sample size. Alpha and beta will also influence the sample size. Delta will. But let's look at this then with some examples. So suppose that we were interested in determining the sample size would we would need in each of two groups to detect a difference of 5 millimeters in average blood pressure between individuals receiving placebo versus drug. And suppose that by convention, we're told to assume a significance level of 5.05 .05, and a power of 
So these can be varied, but what are typically used in many NIH-funded trials is a significance level of 0.05, meaning a probability of a type 1 error of 5%, whereas the power is 80%. Suppose we also knew from a previous study that we could assume standard deviations in blood pressure of 15 millimeters in both groups, and suppose that we would like equal sample sizes. So how would we use this formula to um, calculate sample size? We would plug in 1.96, corresponding to an alpha of 0.05. We would plug in a Z of 0.84, corresponding to a beta of 0.2. And then we plugged in 15 for the standard deviations. We said we were interested in detecting an average difference of 5 millimeters. So the total sample size we would need is 142 in each group. So in other words, a total sample size of 284. Now this is the type of output you would get from Stata. With Stata, I could say my null hypothesis is no difference. So it's the SAMPSI command for sample size. The null hypothesis is no difference. The alternative hypothesis is a difference of 5 millimeters. And I've told it the standard deviations of 15 could be assumed for both group 1 and 2. And I want a power of 80%. So you should see something, a number that looks vaguely familiar. So in fact, Stata has told me I'll do a two-sided alpha 0.05, 80% power. Um, a difference in means of 5, standard deviation of 15 assumed in both, equal sample sizes, the ratio of the sample sizes is 1, and 142 in each group. Now, it's really important to keep in mind that sample size calculations aren't just one number. So what if the standard deviation wasn't truly 15? I've just made an assumption. I might best look at some other assumptions. So suppose it was bigger. If it, the standard deviation was actually 20 millimeters in each group, I would have needed 566 subjects in each group in order to detect a 5 millimeter difference in blood, average blood pressure. But what if I was interested in detecting a 15 millimeter difference in blood pressure? If I assumed a standard deviation of 15, I would have needed only 16 per group. With a standard deviation of 20, I would have needed 63. So usually in a grant, you'd want to see a table like this that says under different assumptions and under differing differences of interest, this is the range of sample sizes I would need. And then usually you try to balance that with time, cost, et cetera. OK, well, let's l extend this then to the two-group comparison. And suppose I was interested in detecting a difference in response rate of 10%. So again, what would clue me into the fact that this is a dichotomous variable? Response? Response, yes or no. It's a rate. It's a percentage. So between patients who have a new versus standard treatment. So again, I'm going to assume a significance level of 0.05, a power of 0.8. And I will assume that the proportion who respond is 0.25 in the standard treatment because there's been some experience with it in previous studies. And assume equal sample sizes. So if P1 I'm assuming is 0.25 and I'm interested in detecting a difference, delta, of 0.1, what would P2 be assumed to be? 0.25 plus 0.1 or 0.35. So I'll plug in into this equation then, I'll plug in the value of z, the value um, of z corresponding to alpha of 0.05 and two tails, 0.84 for the z beta of 0.2. And then remember P1 I'm assuming is 0.25, so Q1 is 0.75, P2 is 0.35, so Q2 is 0.65. Is everyone following me? And the average then of 0.25 and 0.35 when we have equal samples is 0.3. So I can plug this in and get a value of 207 patients per group. And I could have done that with SAMPSI and STATA as well. So I just want to uh, reiterate that the best estimated sample size just isn't just one number. You'd usually want to vary the assumptions and see what the range of sample sizes are under different assumptions and allow for the fact that we don't have perfect knowledge when we make these assumptions.
So we'd like to be able to fluctuate these assumptions. Um, we also might need to consider inflating sample size. So if you know that you might have dropout of patients in a study or treatment crossover, you may want to inflate it by 5, 20%. And again, although you're doing these statistical calculations of sample size, you'd want to balance it by practical considerations as well, both cost and feasibility. So I told you we would spend one moment, and we we're really going to spend one moment, talking about other methods um, sometimes we might be interested not just in the rate at, say, 18 months or 24 months. We might want to use a sample size calculation that accounts for time to event. We might want to bring in person time or repeated measures over time. These are all much more complicated ways of calculating sample size. So in summary, though, I wanted to reinforce the fact that your sample size calculation may be based on precision or hypothesis testing. Certainly for a single sample calculation, we might be only interested in precision. For two groups, it's often based on hypothesis testing, where the null is a null hypothesis of no difference between groups. The aim is to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there appears to be a difference. And we'd like to have adequate sample size so we have sufficient power to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. I wanted to um, take you to a website that's on the listing I gave out. Um, it's under a, the UCLA website, but in fact it has even a better direct calculate, um, address that's not listed on your sheet. But if you write this down, it's calculators.stat.ucla.edu slash powercalc, P-O-W-E-R-C-A-L-C. You can get it through the website that I gave on your sheet, but it's easier to uh, enter this in directly. And what you see is that you can assume a normal distribution and look for either the power that one has given a certain sample size or the sample size one would need given a certain power. So let's just look at clicking on this. So it tells me to input the mean of the distribution under the null hypothesis. So suppose I indicated 5 here. The alternative is 10. The standard deviation was 15. And suppose I say I want a two-tailed test with a significance level that's equal to 0.05. And suppose that the sample size I have is actually a fairly good one of 400. So I'd submit query. And it would tell me the power is greater than 1. Well, that's because my sample size was big. Suppose I only had 35. Now the power is 0.48. So this was a one sample situation. Um, why don't we go back and look at if we gave a given power. So again, I'll look at, at um, 5 and 10 for a difference of 5. Standard deviation we said was 15 two-sided test, and the significance level again we'll say is 0.05, but the power is 80%. So now, what, how large of a sample size would I need to have 80% power in this one um, sample hypothesis test? So it says I'd need 73. I'd need 73 patients to detect this 5 millimeter difference in, um, in blood pressure. Okay, so that's just one tool. Good day. My name's Gail Ryber. I'm the director of the fourth annual VA Summer Epidemiology Conference. I'm also a VA career scientist and a professor of epidemiology and health services at the University of Washington. This past week, we've had a number of students in from across the country learning epidemiologic methods. About a third of the students also required technical assistance. By that, I mean they had research projects or ideas for research projects for which they wanted assistance in the design and ideas about putting proposals together to seek funding. One of the members of our core staff in the Seattle VA Epidemiology Research Center is Nicholas Smith. 
Dr. Smith is an epidemiologist at the University of Washington. He also does research in the Cardiovascular Health Research Unit, and he is the person who coordinates these requests for technical assistance. So first off, Dr. Smith, let's talk about what is technical assistance. Technical assistance is um, basically gives the uh, researchers an opportunity to speak to us directly about uh, questions they may have about um, the research they're conducting. Um, and who is eligible to request technical assistance? We extend our um, technical assistance um, service out to the, uh, um, the general community who's working in VA research. Um, sometimes it's VA researchers, sometimes it's people affiliated with universities who are doing research on veterans' health. Does it matter if they have a research background, if it's a clinician, would that be acceptable? Um, in fact, most of our services are most useful to clinicians who have some, um, maybe some background exposure to epidemiology during medical training, but haven't pursued a master's degree or have a master's in public health in epidemiology. Um, so we're, we're there certainly to provide um, background information and get them started, especially if they have an idea that's of interest to um, Veterans Health and they want to expand that into a, uh, a, full, uh, a full study. So what kind of assistance do you offer? We um, offer a variety of, of, of assistances depending on the needs of the, uh, of the researcher. Um, if we kind of go through the normal order of how you would conduct a study, we certainly help people in refining and defining their study hypothesis. Um, that often leads to questions about the design. Um, you have a question, how do you want to design the study? Um, from there, people usually go out and they, they put these pieces together and create a proposal and um, we're more than willing to review the proposal that they want to submit, either a proposal for an LOI, a letter of intent, or a full proposal for full funding to um, the merit review process or possibly to NIH. Um, once, the, uh, once the study is funded, um, we can certainly provide assistance in managing the data that's been collected and also in results dissemination, which specifically addresses the writing of abstracts or writing of papers that pertain to the study that's been collected, to the data that's been collected for the study. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center is one of three centers, so we know that both the uh, Durham ERIC and the Maverick, or the Boston ERIC, also provide technical assistance. But if someone requested technical assistance from us in Seattle, who would actually be providing that assistance? It depends on what the topic is, Gail. Um, we have a core staff within the Seattle ERIC, and we cover a variety of disciplines, um, and ranging from infectious disease to cardiovascular disease um, to kind of some of us who are basically generic epidemiologists, but we're also connected to the University of Washington, and through that connection, um, we're able to hook people up with a wide variety of, of, of researchers in, in, in a number of different fields. Um, I think this second slide um, demonstrates that. So in the work that you're doing, can someone from outside come and say, even though I'm not affiliated with a VA or a VA research project, can you help me with technical assistance? Sure. Our interest is in, in promoting um, research in veterans' health. And if you are interested in doing research in veterans' health, if you are affiliated or not affiliated with the VA, um, we are certainly willing to, to provide assistance. What topics do you typically cover? Well, issues in the VA um, are, are certainly wide, but ones that come to us fairly frequently are infectious disease, um, issues of mental health, um, certainly cardiovascular diseases and pulmonary diseases, and diabetes. Um, those are fairly common topics um, on which we uh, provide technical assistance. So there's probably an order in terms of timing to request technical assistance. What would that be? It depends on what your, uh, what your needs are, obviously. It takes us um, usually about two weeks to turn around a full proposal review. Um, so you need to obviously um, kind of gauge yourself, um, provided we 
give you feedback that's useful, which I think it normally is, you'll want to probably do some revisions and maybe even send those revisions back to us. So for a full proposal review, we, we certainly like at least two weeks of lead time. If you have a quick question, um, you can either do it by phone. We prefer by email because that's usually the best way to get messages. And we can often turn around a response in a day or two. So to get started, to make a request to you and the Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center, uh, how should one begin? You can go to the web, and on our website, you, uh, there's a technical assistance request form. Given there are so many different sources for research funding within the VA, would you assist someone in their preparation of a career development award? Uh, certainly we have done that in the past. Um, like I said, our, our goal is to promote epidemiologic research um, on veterans' health and provided it pertains to those issues, we'll, we'll certainly provide assistance. There are a number of people who have submitted proposals and have unfortunately not been funded. Uh, are you in a good position to work with those people to prepare for a resubmission? Certainly. And how would, how would it be easiest to do that? Um, when we've done that in the past, we've uh, requested the original proposal and we like to see the comments that's been received from the study section about the proposal. The investigator usually has some ideas about how they want to respond to those comments. We can often provide additional comments um, by reading both the original proposal and reading the critiques and hopefully help them create a proposal that's more competitive. Um, if someone doesn't have an epidemiologist at their site, but they need an epidemiologist on their proposal, are you or are members of the ERIC staff available to participate on proposals? Due to the um, time demands, um, that's usually not the case. We certainly like to be listed as a consultant on the proposal, but we are not um, in the position to provide FTE of an epidemiologist's time for proposals that are written. Um, we can provide assistance while it's being written and after it's been funded, but usually just as consultants. Well, Dr. Smith, thank you very much for joining us today and telling us a bit about the technical assistance, and we're hopeful that people within the VA will request technical assistance with their epidemiology. Thank you.